Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. Hi, I'm Stephanie Craig. Welcome to the History Fangirl Podcast. This is episode 52, the strangely competitive history of the CN Tower. I avoided visiting Toronto CN Tower on my first trip to the city, and even when I went back to the greater Toronto area, I still had no desire to go. But on my third visit, which was in July, I decided that I just I couldn't put it off anymore. It was irresponsible of me as a travel writer to keep going to the city if I ever wanted to write anything about it without having gone to its most famous landmark. And however lame and touristy that I thought it was going to be, I had just to go and do it. I begrudgingly paid my money, went to the top, and the joke was on me because the CN Tower is awesome. And the history of the CN Tower is full of some of the more competitive and ingenious chapters in Canadian history. My guest today is Christopher Mitchell. He's the travel blogger behind the website Traveling Mitch. And he's my co-host for my other podcast, Rick Steves Over Brunch. He is back today to share about this Canadian gym. And then we also do some shameless plugs for our new show, which I hope you guys do come check out at Rick Steves Over Brunch, wherever you're getting this podcast. And on to the interview. My guest today is Christopher Mitchell. He is the author of the travel blog, Traveling Mitch. And he's also my co-host for the Rick Steves Over Brunch podcast. Hi, Chris. Hi, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Doing great, doing great. You were actually on the show last fall to talk about the Grand Bazaar, and that was right after you had moved away from living in Istanbul for three years and moving back to Toronto. And now that you have settled back into Toronto and are traveling all over Ontario and writing all about what it's like to travel around Canada, I thought it'd be fun to have you come back on and talk about the CN Tower which is a place that I admittedly made fun of until I actually went there last month when I came to your wedding. So welcome back and um, excited to talk about Toronto. Yeah, excited to be here, excited to talk about Toronto. I think it's it's fitting because at, at the time I left Istanbul, I was probably more ready and apt to talk about Istanbul than Toronto. And now the uh, the reverse is true. I'm ready, uh, ready and willing to talk about Toronto and Kind of Ontario at large, but I'm assuming we'll focus on Toronto today. Yeah. So the other reason I wanted to have you come back is because you and I started a podcast that is super fun. And we'll talk about it more at the end. But um, it's Rick Steves Over Brunch, where we have been revisiting old Rick Steves episodes and then discussing them. And it has been insanely fun. And we are uh, eight. By the time this episode comes out, we'll have eight episodes of that show out, which is crazy. And uh, do you want to just tell everyone a little bit about that show before we move on? Sure, definitely. Yeah, so I firstly, I'll concur. It's been it's been a ton of fun. Um, it, it really comes from this place of, of both of us loving Rick Steves and, and the way he makes travel accessible for, for so many people around the world, um, particularly North Americans, and, and gives people that strength and confidence to go and travel. And I think that's something both of us try and do in our writing and, and in our content is try and make travel accessible. Um, and I think uh, I think his love of travel shines through. And I think it's, it's really a fun podcast because we're talking about the episodes, but really the episodes and the locations are a launching point for us to talk about our own opinions and ideas. So it really ends up being, you know, Rick Steves over brunch, but but it, it's Rick Steves is the is the base and we kind of build a house around that. Yeah. I So in my head, I picture people watching the episodes because he has them available on YouTube and then listening to the show. But you don't need to do that. <laughs> like, I know people that listen mm-hmm. to the show who just listen to our show. Don't go back and watch, but just kind of think about, like, they know enough about Rick Steves to know, like, what it probably is looking like. And then maybe they'll go back and visit it later. But uh, so, yeah, so just ever to the, to, if you're listening to this, uh, we invite you to come over and check out Rick Steves Over Brunch. It's available wherever you're listening to this podcast. And uh, now let's talk about Toronto. So what was, so the CN Tower... It is inextricably linked to the Toronto skyline, but it was not always there. And it hasn't even been there for that long, which is really weird to think about. But how did 
How old is the CN Tower and how did the project get started? Right. So the the beginning, the formation of the CN Tower, the whole project starts on February the 6th, 1973. So we're talking about, you know, a good amount of time now. Um, but I, I totally agree with you that it, I have the hardest time picturing Toronto without the CN Tower. Um, I think it's funny because the CN Tower actually comes to be because there's Toronto's growing very quickly. It's becoming this financial capital of Canada, um, and a lot of money's pouring into the city. And what's happening is all of these high rises are going up, um, but they're all kind of about the same size, and they're all all of a sudden screwing with the communication abilities of Toronto. They just didn't have a um, enough kind of communication as far as radio and, and, and um, microwave frequencies to to be able to to grow at the rate they were. So they thought, we need to build a tower over these high-rise buildings to be able to get the reception and, and kind of the yeah the network reception they needed. And uh, so they said, well, if we're going to have to build this tower anyways, why don't we make it the largest freestanding structure on the planet? Um, <laughs> and and, um, and so that's what they did. And it's, it's kind of funny because it's, it comes, the whole uh, building of the CN Tower comes from this practical side of things of, you know, if we want Toronto to continue to grow, we need to be able to, we need to be able to have the communication technology to move forward. But they didn't need to make it a big show of Canadian might. Um, And that's what they did is really, I mean, there's always been that uh, competitive nature between Canada and the U.S. And I, I firmly believe that the CN Tower is a, is a direct result of that. Just being like, you see what we can build? We're big boys, too. <laughs> it does. It, that is a, like, as an American, I don't, which we, okay, so on our other show, we talk a lot. We make fun of each other's cultures a lot just because it's, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. we, when the Canadians and Americans go to Europe, we go to Europe with a lot of the same like preconceived notions and a lot of ideas about travel that are similar because we are so culturally similar, but just some things are different. It sounds so American to be like, I'm going to build, like, if we're going to build this, let's make it the biggest thing on the planet. And it, it's funny. Definitely. It's not like stereotypically a Canadian idea, but I like the idea no, that it was a competition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not at all. It's so, and, and um, we'll get into this later, but they, but also, I mean, it's a marvel how quickly they constructed it, how well they constructed it. But I, at the same time, I mean, if you're going to build the tallest structure in the world, you need to be damn sure it's not going to topple down. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but it's it is it is funny to see it comes it, it, the whole formation of the of the tower does come from this practical need, but also from this this really personal performance. So, what was Toronto like before? the tower was constructed. So what is Toronto like in the sixties and seventies? Like from my perspective, I think of like how New York and Philadelphia and Chicago were very different in the sixties and seventies than they were during my lifetime as someone who was born in the eighties. Uh, what was Toronto like? And you were younger than me even. So this is from a historical perspective and not from a personal experience. Yeah. So, so, the, so Toronto in the 1960s is, uh, is experiencing pretty much unprecedented construction boom. Um, the city's growing like never before. Um, and so it, this is really what causes the need for the CN Tower is that it's it's this sort of unchecked growth where everyone's looking up and the, all of a sudden this whole, this whole skyline's appeared. Um, and there's just huge problems with sort of there's huge problems with communication. There just there was not a, a point of communication that was high enough to broadcast over the new buildings. And what was happening was signals were were these new these new um, towers as, as part of this construction boom. Signals were bouncing off the buildings and were creating really poor radio reception and tele, television reception, even for the average resi- resident. So you have people living in Toronto. I'm living in what's supposed to be, you know, the, the, the beacon of civilization in Canada. And I can't even watch TV right now, you know, and it's just, it just didn't vibe with, with the, the idea of Toronto moving forward. And, um, I mean, nowadays we, we have some of the, the clearest reception in North America, largely due to, 
to um, to the CN Tower. I think we have the CN Tower. I mean, most people think of it as a tourist icon now, um, but it does serve something like 16 Canadian television stations and and FM radio and a number of FM radio stations um, for, for strictly for communication purposes. So they decide to build the tower. What was the actual design process and selection process like? So basically, this this whole project starts in in 1973, and obviously before that, because the construction started in 1973. So you have to imagine the concept is born, you know, as a result of the 1960s confusion over communication during the construction boom. Um, so they hire a, a team of people who are sort of the best and brightest architecturally, um, particularly under the, under the guidance of the structural engineer, John Andrews. And you can imagine building this structure is going to be quite a quite a feat. So what they do is they start off with, uh, they start off first with this if, I mean, assuming people have seen the CN Tower, you can, you know, it's, it has three arms, so to speak, uh, on the shaft. And this, they first placed this shaft in the ground with three arms, and it's 335 meters tall, which instantly makes it the tallest building in Canada, even without the top on it, um, which is kind of funny to think about because it wasn't exactly functional yet. Eventually, they, they, obviously recognize the value uh, from a tourism perspective of, of having this be a place people can go up and see the city. So that's when they build this, that circular, I don't want to say cylinder, but it, you know, that what they've placed on top of the three armed uh, shaft. And it's in 1974, they add this restaurant and observation decks. Shortly after that, this helicopter, which is famously known as Olga, places the antenna on top. And uh, on April the 2nd, 1975, the project is complete. And finally, it's open to the public on June 26th, 1976. Um, and that's really when it becomes it, this tourist uh, beacon in Toronto. Um, nowadays, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's garnering maybe 1.5 to 2 million visitors a year. Um, oh, wow. And, and I don't, uh, I don't want to get too far into the future in case you were going to ask about that. But, um, if you've been around there now, you've seen that they've, they've built a whole complex around it. So for, in the first point, I mean, uh, the Rogers Center or which is, oh, Al always called the Sky Dome is where the Blue Jays play. And that's right beside the CN Tower. And what's incredible is when the dome is open, you look right up at the CN Tower. So I had friends come from Cincinnati and we went to a Blue Jays game and they were like, oh, my gosh, like it's just like this imposing structure over the over the stadium. And to even boost it further, you've got a great brewery across the street now at the Steam Whistle Brewery. And across from that is a as a whole game center. And then. Directly beside it, you have the Ripley's um, Aquarium of of Canada. So it's it's they've developed the area into it's not just like a go up the CN Tower. It's like a this is a whole area which you can spend time now. So we'll get back to the history about it in a minute, but just to note, uh, so that aquarium when I was there, uh, so I was staying with one of our mutual friends, and she and I uh, went and to the it was like a. I guess monthly they have a live jazz night in in the summers, and or maybe it might be year on. I'm not sure the exact schedule, but like once a month they have like a live jazz and wine bar, and you can walk around drinking wine, listening to jazz, and watching the sharks and the fish. And it was probably one of the funnest things I've ever done in my life. It yeah, was um, insanely fun. Yeah, uh, so they've they've done a brilliant job of setting it up for to have exactly those sorts of things going on. So the, there'll be like, you know, two ramps where you're checking out whatever it might be, sharks. And then you go to a larger platform and that's where you're going to be hanging out with, you know, and have a glass of wine. And then there's two more ramps. And so I went, I've been to a number of media events there and it is such a fun place because you have the opportunity to, you know, check out the, the incredible uh, marine life. But then there's all of these meeting points, which are like really, really socially, uh, socially friendly. And you can just really tell that um, this is a carefully built, carefully built structure to, to be able to be like a venue for that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I, I, I love it. I think it's a great addition to Toronto. 
So let's jump back into uh, we'll talk we'll do we'll talk more tourism towards the end, but let's jump back a little bit into the story. So it opens up. What's the reception like from Toronto? Because I could see this either being immediately loved or immediately hated. Like it's one of those things that I I don't know how I would have felt if it just popped up in my city overnight and I didn't know about it. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's hard to speak for people back in the day, but I think like anything, um, where they're pouring so much money into, into this, the, I mean, the cost, the cost was $52 million, which doesn't seem like a lot in today's money, but it, you know, it was a fair, fair bit of money. I think you're going to have some mixed reception on it. Some people are feeling like there's overspending at the same time. I know there was a huge faction of people who were excited to be able to, have stronger TV reception and better communication abilities. And then there was a huge faction of people as well who were kind of nationalistic and felt like it was Toronto's time to shine. Um, from what I can gather from from going back, it, it was mostly a positive reception, um, especially when it was completed, um, because it it almost instantly gets the designation of I mean, firstly, it gets the highest wine cellar on the uh, in the world, <laughs> um, so that's kind of cool. But all of these distinctions start to pour onto it, and it's um, it's also one of the seven wonders of the modern world. Um, so you have it. I think whatever dismay there was at first is just sort of brushed away by the by the pride and recognition and the designations that the CN Tower starts to receive. Um, and I think also people realize, I mean, people realize that, like, I, I think there is a real sense of Canadian pride of, like, we can do this. We just built the tallest uh, tallest freestanding structure on the planet. Also, keep in mind that, um, that there's been, I think, at any one time, 17 different free, tall, tallest free ten, freestanding structures on the planet. And the CN Tower held that title for... Um, for 17 years, or sorry, for 34 years. So that's, that's a long time to hold that. And of course, it was, uh, it was replaced as the tallest freestanding structure in the world by, uh, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai in 2007. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's, that's as far as I can gather, whatever, Whatever people felt in the process of of being frustrated by, you know, public spending or this isn't beautiful enough, et cetera, was washed away by the new communication ability and the um, international tourism recognition. Well, and it's just annoying to have a giant construction project in the middle of your city for so long. But, oh, I'm sorry, (laughs) uh, literally a woman. So I'm recording at a cafe because my apartment, I just had to move apartments and my new apartment won't have internet for a while. And I'm looking out the window and a woman just like bit it. And then pretended like nobody saw, and it was the best thing I've ever seen. I've had a really frustrating well, day, so I needed to see that. A little, I know that's terrible, but I needed that. I, think, um, I hope you keep that. I hope you keep that part in the podcast. Oh, one hundred percent. We're keeping it in the podcast. I think I don't remember. So when I, so you know, Caroline Eubanks. So she was on my show a few weeks ago talking about the Pont City Market, and there was an earthquake in the middle of me recording. And I'm pretty sure that we kept that in. But if we didn't... <laughs> I hope we did. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I hope we did. <laughs> I did want to say about, about you mentioning the um, <clears throat> the inconvenience of, uh, of building this uh, downtown. It's actually... The CN Tower is built in 40 months. Um, so, which to me is extremely impressive because I've seen condos go up in less, you know, in, in the same amount of time in Toronto, like condos, which look like they're built on glass stilts, um, take, you know, that amount of time in Toronto these days. So they had, uh, over 1500 people working 24 hours a day, five days a week to get it done in, uh, in that 40 month period. So well, and isn't there some kind of current construction project that is taking like forever there? Um, you mean like every construction project? Well, so <laughs> uh, when I was there, uh, our friend's mother was explaining to me that there's some project that is like in competition with the disastrous big dig in Boston for like how long over budget and crazy it's taking. So, I mean, I could point, I, I can't, I could, I can't really recall what exactly that would be, but I can point to. Um, 
like 10 different places <laughs> where there's problem. I mean, firstly, um, you don't want to turn into a huge diatribe about Toronto, but the public transit system here is it's pretty pathetic, and um, so the you know the grounds have been pretty torn up trying to build, especially this summer. Um, but there seems to be like a a massive lack of progress. There's just like whatever whatever is started in Toronto will take much longer than expected and go way over budget. Um, and the, the part of that is because um, you have projects are taking so long that you're having a shift of government. So. The Liberals were in power, and now we've got um, Doug Ford in power. Whoop de do, um, who's a staunch conservative, who's who is basically cutting funding to a whole bunch of public works projects and things like that. So it's like you, you, it's like it's very common in Toronto for you to be building something and being like, "Hooray, this is going to be great!" And then, like, particularly a conservative will come into power and be like, "How could we spend this? Let's cut education. Let's cut public works. Let's cut taxes. I'm the best." Um, and that's really the flow of Toronto. But I mean, I always try and come back to the notion that Toronto is, in my opinion, and I think universally recognized is still one of the great cities in the world. Um, and, um, it's more of a problem. It's more of a solution looking for a problem than the other way around. So I guess is the, if you're going to get one project, right, this was the project to get right. <laughs> I, I would say so. I, I often, <laughs> well, firstly, I mean, it, this, the, Part of the construction of the CN Tower was giving leeway for um, for storms, etc. So that there is a little bit of give, so it moves a little bit, just so it doesn't have se- severe problems with cracking and things. But I mean, this is—it's not even like a project. It's, it's a project you must get right. You know what I mean? Because can, can you imagine? You know, in the in the news, like the CN Tower topples over. If you look how developed Toronto is around the CN Tower now, that's just. Uh, you know, no jokes aside, like deeply catastrophic. Um, and I think, <clears throat> I think also, um, at least in my opinion now, in the modern, modern age of architecture, a lot of condominiums, et cetera, are being built with, um, some reckless abandon. And I feel like, you know, these are not structures which are meant to, you know, they're not the pyramids, you know, the, these structures are not going to be around <laughs> in the next, you know, in the next however long. But the CN Tower, I think, was one of those buildings that, it was built to try to be around um, because what's the alternative? So, um, but I think, but but it has been universally hailed as a as a um, it's been universally hailed as 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 a, a construction marvel um, and 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 rightfully so. And it's become one of the as I, as I mentioned before one of the seven wonders of the of the modern world. So, yeah, needless to say, you had to get this right. And they did. Is it immediately a tourist attraction or is that something that came later? Well, I think it's immediately of tourist interest. Um, but it is immediately a tourist attraction because it's um, they, they open it up. Uh, they open up the restaurant and the observation deck right away. And then later they built the the glass floor, um, which I don't know if, if you have you been up to the CN Tower? I did. I went up there. Yeah. And I really thought I was going to hate it, and I loved it. I thought I was going to hate it so much. I was like, I can't believe I just paid, like, 30 effing dollars to go to the top of, like, like, I was so mad that I was like, I have to do it. Because, like, how can I write anything about visiting Toronto if I'm, like, I skipped the, the CN Tower? And then I got up there, and exactly. I, like, fell in love with it. And I was really angry about it. But now I have come to terms <laughs> with it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, there's the glass floor there where you can literally look down and see you know see all the way all the way down um so i think it, it's it is immediately a tourist attraction but it really grows as a tourist attraction so in 86 you have a flight simulator ride that appears there um in 98 you get this uh a whole 75,000 square foot sort of fleet of attractions and shopping around the base of the tower. It's also, I mean, the restaurant 360, the restaurant continues to grow, continues to have their wine selection going. Um, and then more recently, even like they're, they're trying to build it up even more. Right. And so more recently, um, 
The big thing is the edge walk. I'm not sure if you've heard about that. I didn't do it because I would have had a heart attack. Exactly. So it's, but it's the world's highest full circle hands free walk. It's a five foot wide ledge around the top of the CN Towers main pod. And um, I've had plenty of friends who have done it. Uh, I'm actually uh, in talks with the CN Tower to to do some uh, media work potentially and to, to do the edge walk. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, maybe I after this like podcast. I really the- should let you do that because somebody like me, right, who has been to Toronto before, not been interested in the CN Tower, thought it was dumb, only did it out of mm. spite, and then loved it. Mm. But I'm the kind of person where if they had done a little bit, if they had better media outreach, I would know a number of people that had done stuff with them, who, and I would have thought I should do it. And then maybe I would have convinced mm-hmm. other friends to come do it, and then I would have talked about it more. Like, I really do think, like, it's, it's one of the things that tourism boards, I think, don't understand, is they need to have ambassadors, not just to get out to the public, but, like... You tell your friends who are also travel writers what's cool about your city. And then when they visit and when they visit you, then they tell their audiences. Like when you came to visit me and Sophia, I showed you what I liked about Sophia. And then you show that to your audience. So mm-hmm. they really I hope they take you up on that because uh, I would probably I don't know if I'd ever do the edge walk because I really do feel like I might die. But I probably would have been more excited about the CN Tower and even talked about it more that day because I didn't even talk about it that much on my stories or anything because I was embarrassed because I didn't get it Mm -hmm. until I got up there. But that's really on them that, like, a travel writer could come to town and not get it. Like, even when I was willing to pay, Mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to work with them, but, like, I didn't get it. You know what I mean? So I Mm -hmm. think they Mm – they part of why I wanted to do this episode is just because I was, like, I feel feel like I need to recant for how wrong I was. But that's – I mean, their marketing team should be – should be telling people that, you know? Yeah. I mean, I haven't, I haven't gotten far in the process of it and I'm I'm assuming they'll be pretty receptive to it because I mean, especially, I'm not sure how, how, uh, if people will remember from the episode before, or if people listen to Rick Steves over brunch, but really, I mean, I lived, I lived in Europe for most of the last decade and I've come back and sort of rebranded in a sense of exploring Toronto, exploring Ontario. And I think it's a perfect brand fit, but they can decide, but, um, I would love to do the edge walk. And I think, um, I think what people don't understand about that, it's not like you're, it's not like you're tiptoeing around the edge and holding on to the side. It's like you have ropes and you, it's a hands free walk and you're like leaning back around and it's, it's, um, it's supposed, you have basically open air views of Toronto and Lake Ontario. And it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, as far as I understand, the whole thing takes, I want to say two two hours or so, maybe a little less than two hours. But everyone who has done it has not been disappointed. I mean, it's it's a real it's a real thrill seeker's dream, right? Um, and I, I would love to do it. That's the thing is, I am not a like a thrill seeker, like in that context. Like that's why I feel like it's not for me, really. Even if you're like completely yeah. safe, I just really I didn't like looking down through the elevators. <laughs> like I'm just not yeah. a heights person. But I do think it sounds for people who are thrill seekers. I don't know if they would know that it was there and how and like yeah. what it is. Yeah, it is thrilling though, really, because and so this is also to this point of whether it was a tourist. Because it, it's really grown as a tourist icon as they've continued to make it more exciting and tourist friendly. That you have the glass floor panel elevators, which are only about ten years old, and they go they go fast. I mean, those things go like you know fifteen miles per hour, and that's really kind of fun. I, I also wanted to say that like, some of the additions are not just for tourism; they're for a sense of. Um, community pride and national pride. So um, they, I think it was, I want to say 10 to 15 years ago, they put, um, or actually maybe even, maybe even more recently, they put um, all these lights on the outside of it, LED lights that kind of shoot up and down the CN Tower. So like on a, if there's a, a Leafs game, there'll be blue and white going up and down. If it's a Raptors game, it'd be purple and red. Um, if it's Canada Day, it's going to be red and white. So it's like, um, it's like this great, you know, it's ironic. It started off as this communication tower, but in in a way, in modern times, it's serving as this sort of like community, like communicative, in a communicative sense, it's a bit of a unifier. 
because it's like everyone knows what's going on in the city kind of from what lights are showing. Also, like during Pride and everything like that, you would have like rainbows going up and down the, the CN Tower. And I think it's a great way to to unify the city. So let's talk a little bit about the evolution. So it, it comes out, people can visit it right away. But yeah, they add they add different things. So what is what are some of the more significant additions and when were they open so people can kind of see how like it really has been like a continual evolution sure so um so immediately gets some of these designations like the high the world's highest wine cellar etc cetera, etc cetera. evolutions from a from a cultural perspective it's in 1995 that the cn tower is deemed one of the seven wonders of the, of the modern world and i think there's no question it gets a tourism boom from that and probably what canada was hoping for from the beginning right i mean <clears throat> if toronto is hoping to be put themselves on this map all of a sudden the cn tower is in the same classification as the empire state building the channel the golden gate bridge it- itaipu dam the panama canal and the north sea protection works so it's like you've all of a sudden You've you you're elevated. I mean, the big thing would be that you're now on the same plane as the Empire State Building, you know, the the, uh, the American cousin. It's like you're there, um, and so uh, basically, I mean, I kind of gave a brief overview before, but it's it's been a continual evolution. Um, one of the focuses really right now is is on making the restaurant even better. Um, it opened with a lot of critical acclaim. It's won a lot of awards for cuisine. I will say, from a um, from a personal Torontonian perspective, most people feel like three sixty restaurant is a little bit overpriced for what you're getting. But of course, you are you know it's it's a you're pretty high up there. Um, so I think you're you're going to pay for that a little bit, but. Um, I think I think this I think the 360 restaurant is looking to brand itself as world class cuisine cuisine, but uh, it's more understood by Torontonians as world class prices for pretty good cuisine. Um, so, what kind of food is it? Because I didn't eat there. Honestly, I have not eaten there, but I, I would. It's it's. I've looked at the menu, and it's it's kind of like uh, it's 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 not particularly Canadian because there's a whole confusion over what Canadian cuisine is, but I think you're well, it's I mean, just, is there I feel like maple syrup. And then yeah, like, maple syrup, what poutine. Else? I mean they sell tarts. maple syrup in the gift shop. I don't really know. I guess okay, so poutine. I guess I consider poutine or no, not consider. I thought poutine was more of a Quebec it dish. It is. Is it a national dish or is it a Quebec dish or has it been adopted nationwide? It's a, it is a, it's for sure it's it definitely hails from uh, Quebec but I mean the Canadians have kind of adopted it um, but I mean Canada at large is really just known for fresh produce etc. Don't get me wrong, I had fantastic food when I was in Canada. I just don't know. Actually, every time I've been to Canada, I've had fantastic food. I don't know if when I wasn't specifically eating poutine, if I ever recognized something as Canadian versus like North American or versus like European. Right. I think I think um I mean to get more into the uh the cultural side of that um I think you have to sort of question what the idea of what a Canadian is. I mean Toronto oh. more than <laughs> I really I, one that is the right answer. Two I appreciate it. I'm not going to go too deep, but this, I love this it. is a part of our history. <laughs> so let me just get get out one you know, one sentence here. So more than if people don't know this, more than 50% of Toronto are not uh, more, more, more than fifty percent of Torontonians were not first generation Canadians, and so what the strength of our cuisine and the strength of our culture comes from the real diversity of our city. And so you have these areas. I mean, I have I had friends come from Chicago last week, and they were like, "We live, we live in Shanghai, and your Chinatown reminded us of that." You know, it was oh, like, I it's liked like your this, Chinatown. This, I walked around; it was really cool. Yeah, it's like there's a genuine authenticity. I mean. I feel like in a lot of – Little India is the same. It's, I love the fact that you can go to those areas and you really can pretend for an afternoon that you're not in Toronto, um, but then remember that you are. Um, and I think that's I think that's awesome. Um, so, so when I talk about Canadian cuisine, I think it's just like it's this great confluence of using, you know, fresh Canadian produce with uh, real 
international recipes and and it's it's definitely i mean that's that's the strength of toronto really is 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 what we have here from from immigration because i mean canada's not that old anyways right so i always feel like there's there's and also, we have different issues as far as population. Canada's got, what, 35 million people? And you guys have 10 times that. So we have the room to to accommodate. We, we need those people to come in here and and uh, help build our, our, our city and our, and our country, both culturally and physically. Well, we need immigrants, too. And I really wish that I had a government that understood that. But uh, yeah. it's nice that they can flee to you guys while we are kicking them out in a horrific manner. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I totally, I think we're, we're very much on the same page with that. I certainly didn't want to insinuate that Canada needs them and America doesn't. Um, no, 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 I just mean that, like, um, I think that, because you and I both lived abroad, I think when you live abroad, you appreciate when your government gives other people the chance to call your country home because you've been had the wonderful opportunity to call someplace else home, even if it's not forever. Mm -hmm. And so it's really depressing. The news, the news is always, de okay, so... Since I've started the show, there hasn't been a single day where the news wasn't depressing because the show just turned a year old. However, some days are more depressing than others. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, the we don't I don't get too deep into politics, but Ontario politics have been very question, questionable. It's forcing us to consider what Canadian values are, but I think it's you just got to keep trucking forward and fighting the good fight and. Um, I will say personally, I love part of the reason I love traveling is because it seems like everywhere I go, someone has a cousin or a brother or a sister in Toronto. It's it's and it's it's just it's really refreshing to to I mean literally uh Bree and I were on St. Thomas two weeks ago and our cab driver was coming to Toronto for Caribana on August the sixth and he had family there. And it's just like, what are the chances of that? And then you you realize with a city like Toronto, really not that bad. They're they're pretty good, and I love that about the city. I really do. How many? How big is Toronto? It depends how you calculate it. the 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 actual Toronto kind of interior is uh, about three and a half million people, a little bit bigger than Chicago. And the Greater Toronto area, which includes like a whole subsect of of Basically, people are working in Toronto, but also, you know, a lot of interesting communities um, is about eight million. So that's, you know, if you think about it from from how important Toronto is to Canada, we're talking about, you know, a little over 20 percent of the population in the, in the greater Toronto area. So that's that's almost unprecedented. And one other fact, just for, you know, whoever's listening, who's looking for those kind of tidbit facts. Um, at last check, I think 90% of the Canadian population lives within 100 kilometers of the American border. Yeah, because like, that's one of the things that you forget when you look at it on a map. It's like when you look at Russia on a map, it's like, well, these are actually like giant swaths of uninhabitable coldness. <laughs> and so everyone is like <laughs> huddled together for warmth or they're in Vancouver having fun. And my cousin, my cousin moved to Vancouver a few years ago from Austin, and I don't think she's ever moving back. She loves it so much. Um, <laughs> but her pictures don't look cold, but everybody else's pictures around, like, October start looking very cold. Yeah, yeah. Right around my birthday, things start to take a turn for the worse. I will say that I've only been to Canada between the months of April and September. And mm -hmm. the April time that I went, we thought we were going on a spring vacation to Montreal. And we were going, what we found out when we got there was it, it was a winter vacation. <laughs> but other than that, <laughs> I think I've, I've managed to only be there during like the best times. But uh, yeah, I'm sure that there's a lot of really fun things to do in the winter, though, for people who like winter sports, which I do not like winter sports. But if you did, I'm sure that's fun. The winter is beautiful. I mean, Toronto in particular, because we, we you know, because the CN Tower became so large we were able to uh continue to build high uh, taller and taller skyscrapers and so you, we've developed a bit of a wind tunnel in toronto in the winter time which can be tough i personally don't mind the winter um uh, i used to, i mean i mentioned this on our other podcast rick steve's over brunch plug um but <laughs> um but there's an old i used to live in norway in 2000 and 10 2009 10 and there's an old saying that there's no such thing as bad weather just bad clothing and i feel like that's a really it's a real truth when you grow up in winter you understand how to dress for winter 
Um, and I think it's like you just can enjoy it. I love I mean, Toronto has the most outdoor hockey rinks, uh, publicly open outdoor hockey rinks in the planet. I think we have 50 or so throughout the city where you can just go. I literally, as a kid, I just throw on a pair of uh, hockey gloves and then uh, I put on a uh, put on a hat, a beanie, or a toque, as we call it in Canada sometimes. You throw your skates on your hockey stick and just walk to the nearest rink. Um, and it was just just great. So I feel like if you embrace winter in the right ways, that being said, th- some days it's just miserable. It's minus 25. You should not be outside. But then you have full permission um, to watch movies and and not be outside and not feel like a degenerate. So there you go. <laughs> so if somebody was going to come to Toronto, what would you suggest they do after or before they visit the CN Tower? Like what is something that uh, wouldn't be on a normal top 10 list? Something that wouldn't be on a normal top 10 list. Um, well, I, I mean, I'm not sure what would or what wouldn't necessarily be on a top 10 list, but I think if you're going to be down there, you should, I, I think what we're talking about before is you should go check out Chinatown because it's not too far away. I personally would, I would start in Kensington Market, which is a really hip area in Toronto with a lot of cool stuff going on. Um, a lot of street art, um, a lot of cafes, especially if you're more interested in uh, weed tourism, et cetera, that's probably a good area to go. And of course, I'm not sure if, if it's recognized, but uh, weed's, weed's going to be legalized in October October 17th in Canada. Oh wow! I didn't. I don't think I. After a certain point, I stopped paying attention to when weed would be legalized places, and that's how I knew I yeah. had turned 30. Yeah, honestly, I, I feel old too. <laughs> I'm, I I like. I the only reason I remember that is because I was in uh, the Ontario Highlands. Do it on a campaign, and I met this wicked guy who had this great house in the woods, and he was very cognizant of when it was going to be legalized. <laughs> so, um, weed tourism but is really I, yeah. helpful. Like, there are countries that for, for whom, like, weed tourism is really important to their economy, besides the Netherlands. Um, yeah. And then there are some yeah, places no. like Uruguay where, like, it's legal for residents, but it's not legal for tourists. And I feel like they're missing a chance to get. Because, like, who's excited? I love Uruguay, but, like, nobody knows to go there. But if they they could put themselves on the map if they expanded in that way. Open up the doors. Yeah. Yeah. To, I mean, to, uh, just just to fin- like finish off the tail of the question, I would go to Kensington. I would go to Chinatown. Um, I would – you might want to scoot back up or do it before, but Queen Street West is a great street to walk down, just pop in and out of stores and bars. I agree. I like that um, a lot. Yeah, it's it's really fun. And then I would swoop down, uh, maybe catch a beer at Steam Whistle Brewery. Actually, you know what? I wouldn't. I would keep walking past the Steam Whistle Brewery about 10 minutes, um, 10 minutes past to the west um, and go to Amsterdam Brew House. It's right on the water. They've got great beer. Um, and then I would walk back up, go to Ripley's Aquarium, CN Tower. I would honestly really... Um, make the make the effort to go to a Blue Jays game. The product on the field right now is average at best, but the experience of being at the Rogers Center, which I'll always call the Sky Dome, and I hate myself for calling it the Rogers Center, is um it's a stadium that holds fifty thousand people, pretty raucous fan base. But if the dome is open, it's an unforgettable, unique experience. So. Those, I mean, my, uh, I got carried away and my things, which would be a little bit different, turned into things which we'd find on a top 10 list. But I think that's true. I mean, if you're looking for something really off the beat, I would go to the east and I would check out Leslieville and then go all, and then scoot up towards Little India um, and, and check out that area. But I think there's, there's so much to discover. And then if you go, I mean, yeah, I could go on for, for days about it, but I think, you're not going to go wrong here. If you want to be really Canadian, you could always pop into the Hockey Hall of Fame, too. <laughs> I, yeah, I did not know that that was there. And I don't. I'm not shocked. I'm not shocked. I, I'm not shocked. <laughs> I, what I'm, so actually, it's not in Toronto, but in Montreal, there's a, like a really cool, weird French smoking bar. Called, so like every bar? Well, <laughs> this one specifically, it's like extra French. I think it's called like... Um, like it's more like Parisian French, not just like it has French food, but um, it's like gotcha. it's supposed to look like Paris in the twenties, and I think it's called Le Alexander, or it could just be Alexander. But upstairs, there's like a old school. It almost looks like an old school smoking lounge library with like 
big overstuffed chairs and like velvet everywhere. And there's never been anybody, I've been there three times and there was never anyone else in there when I was in there, but the waitresses will come up and serve you up there. And you can smoke cigars in there. And then they just have a big fireplace and then a big TV with like ESPN. And so I did sit and I have watched some like really terrible hockey games and they just felt perfect in that room. But I don't know if I would watch hockey in any other circumstance. <laughs> hockey is shockingly exciting in person. I've, I've been to some, um, um, some games, uh, randomly, not the Philadelphia Flyers, but I did, the Oklahoma City used to have like a D3, whatever, and those were fun. Like, And then afterwards, after one of the hockey games, there was a Village People concert, which was really cool in like 1997. That sounds fun. It was probably an a. This probably an AHL affiliate there. Yeah, probably. So I don't really know the the things, but yeah. Um, <laughs> so, all right. So we've already told people that they can find you and me at Rick Steves Over Brunch, and if they're interested, mm-hmm. especially like this, this episode was really good. So, like, obviously we cover the history, and if you like the history, you're going to stay subscribed to this show. But if you like that other piece where we're just like shooting the shit about like travel. It, like think of that that but plus talking about how awesome rick steves is and that's basically our show <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah and i yeah i think also since the begin in the beginning we were so, we were a little bit more uh focused on just talking about the episode and as we've progressed we got a little bit looser and just talking about our own experiences and then sort of valuing that both of us have traveled a lot and have, I'd like to think we have a fair bit to share. Otherwise we're in the wrong line of work. Um, but yeah, I agree. I think if people are looking, if people like our banter and our, uh, the way we bounce off each other, then they're going to like our other podcast, regardless of if they like Rick Steves. Yeah. And if you don't know who he is, come check out the show or, and then you will get obsessed with him. And then you also will spend hours on YouTube watching his old episodes. So besides uh, Rick Steves Over Brunch, uh, where can people find you? So people can find me uh, www.travelingmitch.com. I always make the stipulation that it's um, 1L for the Canadian audience. But uh, I know if your audience is predominantly American, it's not going to be a problem. Um, you can find me at Traveling Mitch on all social media. I have some other subsidiary brands, but I'll mention those a little bit later on Rick Steves Over Brunch um, when they're a little bit more developed. And, um, yeah, I mean, you can, you can find my writing. If you go to charliemitch.com slash portfolio, you can see my, a lot of my freelance work, uh, around, around the internet, but that's mostly where you can find me. Yeah. And And what about yourself? Well, uh, so what we'll do is we'll put a link to your website in the show notes so people can check you out. And then I'm going to be writing. So I went to Toronto obviously for your wedding and I've been there before. I'm going to, I have no nothing about Canada on my website right now except uh, for the Josiah Hinson episode because he ended up living in Ontario. So if you're interested in old school Ontario history, check out the episode of the show about Josiah Hinson, which I'll link to in the show notes. And then, uh, yeah, just come check me out on History Fangirl. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Steph. Always a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. And I know that in the future you have a secret, secret podcast you will be launching down the road and whenever you launch that you'll come back and you'll tell us about it yeah for sure that that podcast is a project that i've been mulling over how i want to do it in my mind for a long time but uh well we launched another podcast since the time um, you told me about that podcast the very first day i met you and since then you've yes, launched like other websites and a whole but like this um, is your like passion yeah. project and i can't oh, wait for it to come out um, yeah, I've launched a number of brands, a number of web, a number of websites. But it's it's it's. Um, I promise you, it's one of those projects I just want to do right. But I also recognize that in this space of podcasting and, and especially creativity, where you're at the helm of it, it's better to be good and there than perfect and never happened. So I will get that started. I'm absolutely swamped right now in work, which is kind of where I want to be um, until pretty much the end of September. But I think October is, is, the, is, the, is the month I'm really going to try and make a push to, to get that going. And that might be a good time to come back on. Well, what I will say just in my experience from this show is, um, and a little bit from our show, but our show is pretty new. Is that so? I just went back a couple weeks ago and did the like first year anniversary episode, and I had to listen to clips that were recorded at different times throughout the year. And you can just tell that the show, hopefully, audience will agree, is getting better. 
because the first episode I could even hear like the audio sounded insane. My mic wasn't set up right or whatever. But if I hadn't put that episode out, I'd never have like kept going. So the weird mistakes in the early episodes are just kind of like a good sign of growth instead of like embarrassing or whatever. And if it's an ep- podcast you're recording yourself, I know people like uh, David Crowther, who was on the show, um, who was on this, ep- who was on my show, talk about the Roman baths. He, he re-recorded all of his, like, first two years of episodes for his History of England podcast. So just get started. Mm. We all want to hear it. Yeah, fair. I think that's, that's, that's more than fair. I need, to, I need to get started. But I also think um, I will also just give you a, a thumbs up as well. I've been listening to your podcast as well, and I will say it's not just a feeling. Everything's sounding great. You're getting better at all aspects of it. So. I should give you a warm congratulations on all the hard work. I don't know how, if, I mean, I know how much work you put in behind the scenes. I'm not sure if your audience does, but um, you do a lot of work for, for your audience. So they should, they should make sure they give you uh, five stars and a big hug. Ah, well, thank you so much. And uh, we'll talk again soon because we have more episodes to record for our other show. So come find us at Rick Steve's Over Brunch because we are there and we're waiting for you and we really like talking about travel. So... Thank you so much, Chris. For sure. You're very welcome. See you soon, Steph. Thanks again to Chris for coming back on. I rarely let him brag about Canada, but uh, for this episode, he had every right to show off a little bit, and I really enjoyed... I just was not a Toronto fan. Like, I just wasn't. Just straight up, I wasn't a Toronto fan. I didn't get it. I thought the city was like the RC Cola version of New York City. And so it was really fun this year going back and seeing it with, um, well, I didn't see it with him, but seeing it with our other friend, uh, our mutual friend, Aaron. And then also just like watching him go back to his hometown and like writing about Ontario has been really fun. As a travel writer, uh, we can get so caught up in all of these new places. And I know that when I went back to Philly this summer, I remembered all of these things that I want to tell you guys about, about Philadelphia And it's fun to watch him do that same um, thing for Toronto and really just become obsessed with Ontario in a way that, honestly, he just wasn't a year ago. So uh, thanks again for coming on the show. Definitely, if you liked this episode, definitely come find us at Rick Steves Over Brunch. It's a podcast that we are doing just because we find it so much fun. And we really hope you join us. You don't have to watch Rick Steves. You never have to have seen an episode. Just come over and then I guarantee you'll want to watch the show too. Housekeeping. Uh, The 50th episode was two weeks ago. If you haven't checked out any of the back episodes from the first year of the show, if this is your first episode or if you've only checked out a handful, go back into the archives. I have had the opportunity to interview some of the most amazing people about some of my favorite places in the world. And I really, there isn't a single episode that I wouldn't recommend you diving into. Keep in mind the first six episodes, the sound quality is a little bit different, but um, just, yeah, go into the back archives. They're evergreen. They're never going to be old or stale. There's nothing that we do in this show that is um, time sensitive. So go back and look at some of the episodes that you may have missed. And um, if you have a favorite episode or a favorite moment from the show, I'm still taking your guys's um clips, favorite clips and stuff, because I'm going to, in a few weeks, I'm going to share what you guys thought was the best from the first year. I've gotten some good ones, but if you have anything you want to tell me about, you can email me at stephanie at historyfangirl.com. Tweet at me, a history fangirl, Instagram me at history fangirl. Just find me and tell me what were some of your favorite moments from the show's first year. And I'm going to share those in a few weeks. If this is your first time listening to the show, you can head to historyfangirl.com, which is my website. It has links to Every single episode, you can listen to every episode on my website. You can listen to every episode via the podcast app of your choice. You can find all of the links for all of the different ways that you can listen to it on my website, which is historyfangirl.com. If you are a listener and you've been a listener for a while, if you haven't rated and reviewed the show, it would mean so much to me if you would. Every time I see a new review, I get a little giddy. So that would be great. And um, I know that I said this two weeks ago when we celebrated the end of the show's first year, but I really just do want to say, you guys, thank you so much for listening.